The second lesson from the Gospel of Mark. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. And the Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness 40 days, tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild beast, and the angels waited on him. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God and saying, The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. On this first Sunday in Lent, O oh God, meet us where we are and open our hearts to you. Amen. Have you thought about going on a pilgrimage? Uh, this past week, I facilitated a church book club where we discussed the book, Chasing Francis. The fictional story is about a pastor of a large church who has a very public crisis of faith. It turns out that the death of one of the children of the church, a six-year-old girl, has prompted his doubts and his stock answers about God and how God works just don't seem to ring true for him anymore. And when he goes off script on a Sunday, sun, on a Sunday morning sermon, putting his doubts and questions on display, well, there's trouble in River City. And as a result, the church leadership places their pastor on a leave of absence. And the pastor uh, ends up in Italy on a pilgrimage. Turns out he is chasing the spiritual icon Francis of Assisi, a 12th century unconventional figure who went from being a, a wealthy warrior soldier to a devout but sometimes eccentric follower of Jesus. That part of the story is true. Francis lived or tried to live as Jesus lived, which attracted others uh, to Francis, which turned into a movement which was important for the church of its day. That movement became the Franciscan order, and that monastic order has been made even more popular today, uh, even among Protestants, because the present Pope is a Franciscan, and he chose the name uh, Pope Francis after Francis of Assisi. Well, in the story, this minister sorts out his crisis of faith by putting himself in the places of of St. Francis, where he lived, where he ministered. I mean, around Assisi in the Tuscany region, he visits churches and chapels and villages and caves where Francis once walked. In essence, he takes a pilgrimage. You know about pilgrimages? A pilgrimage is a journey made to some sacred place as an act of spiritual devotion. B behind the pilgrimage is a belief, or at least a hope, that 
being in a particular place will have spiritual power. For Christians, it could be visiting Jerusalem and sitting among the 2,000-year-old olive trees in the Garden of Gethsemane, the place where Jesus prayed after the Last Supper and knowing those trees were there. Or standing on the hill uh, looking over the Sea of Galilee where Jesus delivered the Sermon on the Mount. Or where Jesus fed the 5,000 with a few loaves and fish. Uh, Several years ago, I I led a group of Presbyterians to, to Italy. And in Rome, we spent this very special Sunday following in the footsteps of the Apostle Paul, walking in those places, visiting in those houses and chapels and churches that tradition says Paul once ministered around, lived in, wrote, prayed. It was so spiritually meaningful. So a pilgrimage seeks a deeper connection with God using a place as the medium. Christians have been going on pilgrimages for for centuries. But we Protestants have been reluctant to embrace the idea that, that a place, that a place could hold holy power. Well, this past Wednesday, we began Lent with the crosses of ash marked on our foreheads. And it has prompted my thinking about a Lenten pilgrimage. We are traveling to a sacred place uh, this Lent, the tomb of Jesus on Easter morning. But I really love uh, the saying... The journey is the destination. We have miles to go before we reach the empty tomb on Easter morning. And I am inviting you into a pilgrimage, a Lenten pilgrimage, where we allow the journey to become the sacred destination. Will you come along? Well, in today's scripture, Mark uh, shows us the beginning of the pilgrimage of Jesus. Gospel writer Mark, in his rapid-fire way, uh, shows how this pilgrimage of Jesus begins. (coughs) In six verses, uh, Mark reveals first that Jesus is baptized. Baptized by John the Baptist where he receives God's blessings and confirmation. Then Jesus is driven into the wilderness for 40 days where he confronts demons and beasts. And then Jesus emerges to launch his ministry by proclaiming the good news of God that the kingdom of God was now at hand. Baptism. Wilderness, the launching of Jesus' public ministry. Now, we often wonder why Jesus was baptized. As John would say in so many words, he needs to be baptizing me, not me, him. But it seems apparent that baptism was an important symbolic beginning for Jesus' ministry. Baptism is the the first public step to what will be three years of teaching, preaching, healing, ministering, and leading. And when Jesus is baptized, God's Spirit descends on him and he hears a voice saying, You are my son, my beloved. With you, 
I am well pleased. What is this? I mean, this is the affirmation. The affirmation from from God the Father. Jesus is loved. God is well pleased. And this is the confirmation that that God is with him. That God is 100% Uh, behind him as he begins his earthly ministry. I mean, there's nothing like the power of being affirmed by your father or your mother, right? When I was a kid, my dad would say things to me like, you're going to break a many a girl's heart which I thought was stupid and ridiculous. Or when I was a teenage uh, baseball pitcher, and we were playing a team that was a lot better uh, than we were, he said to me the morning of the game, they put their pants on the same way you do. Which was his way of saying to me, they are not better than you are. Affirmation, those words where we know we are, where we are loved, that they, whoever they are, are in our corner, that they are our biggest cheerleaders. I mean, those words are so critically important, especially when the wheels come off, and they always do, right? This morning we celebrated the baptisms of Jones and Brooke. And in the rejoice service, uh, they are baptizing Garnet and Melody. In essence, the symbol of the water is that God claims us. God claims our children. That God is in our corner, that we are God's loved and beloved. When the reformer, Martin Luther, uh, would get discouraged, he would put his hand on his head and he would say, I am a baptized child of God. It was his way of reminding himself that God had his back, that he was God's beloved, that God loved him. The the affirmation of God, symbolized in baptism, launches the ministry of Jesus. But the very first stop in Jesus' ministry is, well... Surprising. Rather than a champagne breakfast by the Sea of Galilee commemorating the launching of the most important spiritual campaign ever launched in the history of of, of humankind, Mark says that the same Spirit who was present at the baptism drove Jesus into the wilderness for 40 days where he encountered beast and was tempted by Satan. Now, we don't know how Mark might have been using powerful metaphors here. And we know from the other gospel renditions of the wilderness temptations that Jesus was being tested to see what kind of ministry he was to lead and what kind of Messiah he was going to be was his ministry to be political humanitarian populist or something else well you and I know that temptation is real regardless of the source or how temptation occurs My guess is 
that we can all tell stories. Stories of uh, how we've been tempted and how we are still being tempted, both in small ways and in ways that have huge consequences for our life and for the life of the people around us. How do we deal? How do we deal with with those kinds of temptations, or how do we survive them? I think most of the answer is right here in this text, in this story. The baptism of Jesus was about Jesus establishing his identity. He was the beloved, affirmed Son of God, which is to say that when Jesus is flung into the wilderness of temptation trying to discover what kind of ministry he is to lead and what kind of Messiah he is to be, he draws on his baptismal experience of identity and affirmation to get clarity so that he does not turn into something that he is not that he's not the kind of Messiah that he doesn't want to be. You with me? I mean, how many times did you tell your children or have you told your children, especially your teenage children, remember who you are or remember where you came from? I mean, there is a sense about those words that remind us that we come from a family that stands for certain things, that we have certain values in this family. Not that we can ever live up to all of that, right? I mean, we are human beings, flawed and vulnerable. And we remember that we are not defined by our worst moments or our poorest decisions and sometimes the way we recover from failure and wrong choices is by remembering who we are and whose whose we are I'm in your corner says God you are my beloved you think you're the only one in the world who has messed up repent Believe the good news of the gospel. Get on the road to Jerusalem. And it is on that road to Jerusalem, to the empty tomb, that I am inviting you to travel. Let's make Lent meaningful. Let's make this a a, a pilgrimage. A pilgrimage as in a a sacred place. We have roughly 40 days to make the journey the sacred destination. How will we do it? By being intentional. Traditionally, uh, a lot of Christians have have give up something uh, for Lent. Food is always popular, meat or alcohol or dessert. I knew a guy once who gave up smoking cigarettes every Lent. Boy, was he glad to see Easter. (laughs) Now I hear folks giving up TV or, or Facebook or um devices, media devices in the evenings. The purpose of of giving something up should be that those things hinder uh, our relationship with God or, or with God's people, or at least that by giving them up, we are experiencing in some measure the sacrifice of Christ. But I, for one, am less a giver-upper, though sometimes I have been, 
and more of uh, of a adding to. If um, if the purpose of Lent is to get me spiritually ready for Easter, I want to add something that enables me to be a deeper spiritual person and a better follower of Jesus. So think about a Lenten task, for instance, that may help someone or help others. What would that be for you? Or how about a, 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 a commitment to daily prayer, five minutes a day, just five minutes a day, or, or learning some new ways uh, to pray, or reading the Gospel of Mark, which will take you max two hours, maybe three, uh, certainly doable and divided over 40 days. Or, or learn the spiritual practice of, of uh, reading and praying over the Scriptures. A practice called Lectio Divina. Or commit to attending our 30-minute contemplative service on Wednesday evenings at 6 o'clock. Where with Scripture and silence and prayer and music. Our purpose is simply to rest in God. But this past Wednesday changed how I was thinking about Lent. On Wednesday, again, we experienced a horrific mass shooting in our country. This time in Parkland, Florida, 14 high schoolers dead, three of their teachers dead. The gunman, a 19-year-old former student who took a semi-automatic weapon and gunned down his classmates as they were leaving the school because he'd set off the fire alarm. Horrible, tragic, senseless. It is every parent's nightmare. It is every grandparent's nightmare. And, of course, the children of this country are just so anxious and fearful that it'll be their school next week. And who can blame them? After Columbine and Virginia Tech and Newtown and the other school shootings in this century where at least there have been ten others, where at least five Students have been shot and killed. And I'm just talking about school shootings, not about Orlando or Las Vegas or the Texas church shooting last fall where 26 people were shot and killed. Since Wednesday, several people have expressed to me not only their sadness but their mounting frustration that we in this country cannot or we will not do the things necessary to stop this madness from going on. They want to know what we can do, what they can do. So do I. I have lots of questions about why we can buy a semi-automatic weapon in this country or where mental health comes in to this issue or where the line is drawn between our individual rights and what is best and right for our country's welfare and health. So during my Lenten pilgrimage, I will be praying about gun violence in our country. I will pray for those families who've lost their beloved children. And I will pray for those families who lost their fathers, who were teachers, and husbands, and brothers who were teachers. And I am going to pray for people 
who are trying to make a difference, who are seeking a way to find a way around people and organizations and institutions who, for whatever reason, are not helping us solve this incredibly heinous, destructive problem. And I will pray that good people will find a way and that that way will become obvious to us who believe that this has just got to stop. My pilgrimage will include uh, learning. During Lent, I'll be reading uh, position papers and studies and statements from theologians and churches about guns and gun violence and seeking biblical studies that, that focus on this issue. Because for me, as a Christian, as a pastor, as your pastor, I don't really care so much about opinions or about politics. What I care about is what it means to be a Christian in this debate. And what my faith and what your faith tells uh, me to think and what to do. I mean, what would Jesus do? If you want to join me in my pilgrimage, I'm beginning a, uh, a Lenten blog that will go up on our webpage today or tomorrow. And in it, I'll be exploring, I'll be praying, I'll be thinking, I'll be reading and reflecting. So my Lenten pilgrimage will include praying and learning and thinking and hopefully doing. Because it's the words of Martin Luther King and words that so many others have said in similar ways. For evil to succeed, all it needs is for good people to do nothing. So I invite you to turn this Lent into a pilgrimage where the journey is a sacred destination.